So the car companies have all installed side airbags. I think there's nine or ten airbags on a car now, if you buy it, even a, the smallest one. So this is what's driving uh, the, uh, the development of new automotive materials, fuel economy and safety. In Europe, more or less the same story. Uh, fuel economy in, uh, in the EU is, is also uh, uh, a big driver on this thing. Uh, safety, the Euro NCAP side impact regulations. And then of course they have like uh, uh, much more severe uh, tailpipe emission requirements than we do in, in the Americas, although uh, the US does have it in, in many regions. So, th so we're looking at uh, fuel economy because of uh, oil conservation and dependence on oil, safety of passengers as vehicles get uh, you know, smaller, maybe lighter, there is uh, a need to protect the occupants even more. And then emission regulations to protect the air that we all have to breathe. So all this really, all the stuff that's happening outside the steel mill, you know, and we have no control over it, is forcing us steel makers to get into products that we've never really ventured into before, and that's the red oval that we have. So that's where the opportunity to, to develop new grades of steel and help car makers meet their goals of fuel efficiency, uh, safety, and emission control. So that's the one I'll be talking about in some detail, the, the products that fit into that red oval. Now, in terms of process, which is really not my strength uh, because I was more on the product side, but product technology trends uh, have really also uh, been a very important part in delivering uh, the, uh, the, you know, the new products that uh, we need. So from a, environment, from a uh, continuous galvanizing uh, standpoint, environmental efficiency has become very critical. Uh, so as, my, as le uh, le less waste as possible, so le use less heat, use less power, and of course generate zero waste if possible. Uh, to do this and to, and to produce uh, the steels that we need, uh, th there's certainly a lot of work been done on multi-wavelength uh, spot pyrometers that are much less sensitive to the steel emissivity uh, or the surface emissivity that, uh, that you get with, with uh, hot dip galvanizing of various types of uh, alloy, uh, high strength, low, uh, low alloy steels. Um, snout control. I don't know how many people here in the room uh, are familiar with, uh, with uh, hot dip galvanizing lines, uh, continuous galvanizing lines. The snout is probably the one that uh, we need to pay attention most because uh, we have to make sure that the steel temperature, uh, the uh, snout atmosphere, and, and certainly the strip temperature is exactly where it needs to be before it enters the pot. So that's, uh, that's especially important when we're talking about the advanced high strength steels that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, control and management of the uh, zinc wettability uh, is, is getting more important because of these fancy uh, advanced high strength steel uh, compositions. You know, uh, we are entering a riskier regime in terms of zinc wettability and also surface treatment. So surface treatments in the furnace and all that is required. And then strip stability, I mean there's not a single person who has been close to a galvanizing line knows how important it is to keep the pass line really stable as it gets into the pot and as it exits the pot. So uh, technologies that are in place now and are hopefully being implemented in more and more galvanizing lines the use of electromagnetic strip stabilizing systems uh, that'll, you know, that are placed just above the coating lines. And it, it has a, a, a huge advantage. So not only does it stabilize the pass line, but it allows steel mills, frankly, to save money because it'll improve your coating uniformity. Your coating control will drop from, you know, standard deviation of five to maybe uh, under two. And so these are, these are good things to have because not only do you have product that you can ship out as high quality first time around, but you save money doing it in terms of not giving away uh, valuable zinc. 
Um, it allows you to make thinner coatings, so there is a trend to get down to lighter and lighter coating weights. Uh, we've seen companies in t like Toyota in North America ask about 30 grams with a standard deviation of, le of one and a half. So, you know, th these things are gonna help uh, us try and get to where, uh, where the customers are leading us. It also allows us to run at higher line speeds and who doesn't want to run faster because that's what generates uh, tons per hour. Okay, so those are the sort of the major uh, improvements that are being made uh, on galvanizing lines. Now with those changes, uh, there come some risks. And basically, high tech, as we sometimes see even on the small home appliances and PDAs that we use, you know, the higher, the, the, the more complex the technology and the more important that class one exposed skin surface, you, you've got to pay attention to a bunch of things in the process and, and the design side. So the utilities, the quality of utilities, in the old days we just used water from the lake, you know, now you've got to use city water, uh, gas, um, gas compositions, the uh, hydrogen, nitrogen content, the cooling of the electrics, that's important. Instruments calibration, because we're relying on them so much more now than in the past. Uh, how often do we maintain and how frequently do we maintain the quality of spares and so on. So all this is, is putting a lot more risk into the equation. Uh, and then to compound things, we've got one line trying to produce so many different types of strength levels. So we've got to get lineups that are long enough to, to run, you know, a shift or more. And now we're talking 12-hour shifts. So we need, we need a line to be stable and to make one type of product as long as possible. And with multi-coating lines, this is, not, this is not always possible. Compound that with different annealing cycles, number of steel roughness uh, types, and of course, thickness and width uh, ranges, you know, and everybody wants to go wider now because they can make double attached parts instead of making one part. So all this uh, throws some risk at us and uh, we need to manage all that. And then of course there's, uh, there's more risk. Uh, you know, you got uh, malfunctions that, uh, that happen when you've got complex uh, uh, three, le three level systems of computers and, and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and then of course more, more models and, and more complex, you know, all these, all these lines now run on computer models requires highly personal, uh, highly qualified personnel, uh, both for the repair and improvement, but also for detection side. And, and that's sometimes can cause a major uh, shutdown because a lot of these sensors, if they send something out of whack, they just shut down. So with that comes loss of production and then of course major headaches. So uh, on the products, so let's turn to the product now. Uh, you know, that's about all I had on process, and if you were expecting a little bit more, we'll have to ask Frank for some more guidance on that. But uh, on the product side, let's take a look at what, uh, what product. So here's the, here's the graph I showed before, and that's where all the steel makers are playing now. They're trying to develop products that'll fit into that red oval. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, the evolution from uh, mild steel down to IF steels, you know, the vacuum degassed, uh, extra deep drawing quality. We've seen IF, medium strength, high strength. We've seen carbon manganese grades that have been as old as I am. Uh, HSLA, traditional HSLA up to about 350 MPA. So we've seen all that. And then, of course, comes dual phase and trip and Martin Siddick steels and now more complicated stuff coming down the, down the line. So, oops, I didn't, uh, I didn't expect this slide to show all these, but let's, uh, let's look at all these uh, in total. Uh, if you can read the, this, uh, you know, it's, it's all these grades of steel, low carbon, forming steel, structural steels, deep drawing, extra deep drawing, HSLAs, and then advanced high strength steel. So all these are the substrates we have to deal with. And here's some of the chemistries that are being used. And uh, it's fair to say that dual phase and trip, are the, uh, trip steels are the most uh, commonly used uh, ones today. And certainly in the next 
Frank, what would you say, three, four, five years? Uh, they'll be, they'll be, and I'll show you some slides that show exactly where this is likely going. But you can see that microalloy grades, uh, you know, we used to use uh, titanium, columbium, or niobium as it's called here, um, and uh, vanadium, you know, for your know, hardening. Uh, then rephosphorized grades came along, then of course IF grades with medium strength. Bake hardenable grades uh, are being phased out uh, in, and replaced with more uh, dual phase type steels. And then of course the trip grades. So you can see the, the chemistries and, and the alloying elements are getting you know, pretty significant here now. So you've got higher manganese levels. Of course carbons, uh, you know, carbon is, can be used up to 0.4%. But uh, we always worry about carbon because all our stuff is still welded and uh, we need to stay as low in carbon as possible and still get the, the sort of microstructure that we're targeting. Uh, chromium and moly, uh, molybdenum, uh, up to 1.2%. I didn't think we would be ever rolling stuff like that, but we are. Uh, silicon levels, uh, are very significant. And of course, you've got all these other grain refining elements that are used. All this is showing us that these chemistries are getting pretty complex, uh, not just to, to obtain, and there's a fair amount of cost implication in getting this and uh, getting these alloys, and, and we have no control over the cost. So a lot of steel companies in North America have instituted uh, 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 an upcharge, what do they call it? It's, it's basically a, an extra charge depending on where the price of molybdenum and Columbium and, and play, uh, elements like that go. So uh, this is uh, this is going to cause more of that volatility. And of course, once you commit to may, to providing a supplier with those steels, the advanced high strength steels, you have to produce them, and you have to have your access to the alloying elements. So here's your typical mechanical properties of the advanced high strength steels that we're talking about. All this that fit into that into that red oval that I was showing earlier. Uh, the, first, the first one, of course, has is, is been in existence for 30 years, you know, the grade 50 microalloy, high-strength low-alloy steel. And then, of course, the family of dual phase, trip, uh, and, of course, the Martin Siddick. So you can see these are the targets we're, we're aiming for, and, and I think most of the mills, certainly in North America, uh, uh, are achieving those. Uh, some of them that cannot achieve it have just taken themselves out of that market for, uh, for those particular grades. But it's fair to say that at least three mills in North America can supply any one of these grades and that's exactly what car companies want. They want a minimum of three suppliers. Now in the case of India, uh, and I don't have it in this presentation, but to, uh, tomorrow I think I show some slides of, uh, of uh, Indian steel producers uh, and, and their capability to make some of these grades. And uh, it's fair to say that not, a, not everybody, in fact, maybe one milk is capable of that, of, of this, certainly on the dual phase, the, the high strength dual phase and the trip steels. But, uh, but we're getting there. So, you know, JSW started up a line that will, you know, with JFE technology is going to make a lot of this possible. Tata Steel has, um, plans to, uh, to build brand new lines with fast cooling rates, and so that's good news, and of course POSCO is here already. So uh, all good news for, for India in terms of when we get to the stage, we'll be able to produce and supply with at least three suppliers. Uh, here's typically the tensile properties of the steels uh, that we're talking about. So you can see, and I don't want to dwell too long on this, but uh, typical stress strain curves for everything from the standard HSLA steel, 65 KSI or 450 uh, MPA, and then all the way up to those, the, the really high strength dual phase Martin Siddick type. Now here's an interesting look into the future as to where, uh, where these high strength steels and advanced high strength steels are likely to go. So in 2006, you know, mild steel the, the pie chart on your, on your left, uh, uh, and my left too, isn't that something? They're both on our lefts. 
Mild steel was uh, five years ago, eight years ago, was, uh, was 63%. Look where, uh, look where mild steel is going to likely be in a couple of years' time. We're, it's going to be down to 15%. Look at where advanced high-strain steels was in 2006, at only 6% on a body in white. So, uh, and, and look where it's likely or projected to go to, 52%. So you can see it's pretty dramatic. And for the car industry to do all this in about eight years, is uh, certainly unprecedented. Uh, there will always be a place for high strength structural steels because typically control arms, underbody structurals, you need the, you need the thickness in order to uh, deliver the, uh, the structural integrity and the deflection and the rideability. So there will be a place for high strength steels more or less at uh, you know, 30, 31%. Now, you look at this and you say, okay, how much of that is going to be coated steels? Because that's really what we are, right? We, we're, one, we, we're trying to sell galvanized uh, sheet steel. So if you look at this graph and now look what happens to the, to the uh, whether it's coated or uncoated. And you can see again on your left hand side, you know, mild steel accounted for 35% uh, as coated in 2000, well, 2006 uh, is my, yeah, this, this graph still relates to 2006. And uh, uh, mild steel, as re remember we said, it's going to shrink and use, but whatever is left is going to be, uh, is going to be coated, you know, more or less coated. So it's going to go down from 35% down to 10%, mild steel is, but uh, it's still going to be uh, uh, mostly coated. There's only a 5% uncoated product and I'll bet you that's probably the roof of the car because it's really typically not used uh, as coated steel. But look where, um, look where the advanced high strength steel coated product is on the, on the left hand side. 2006 was, it accounted for 26% and it's expected to, to account for 55%. So again a huge uh, a huge swing towards coated steels from uncoated steels. And um, as you can see, you know, uncoated mild steel is going to drop from about 28% down to about 5%. So uh, all this is pointing to the fact that we better get our act together on how to make galvanized high strength, advanced high strength steels on CGLs, either that we have today or that we're building. Because that's where the car companies of the future are going to want to go. So, oh, that's right, yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's take a look at some examples of actual car companies and, and uh, what their plans are. So General Motors uh, uh, is planning to, to uh, General Motors in, in North America, but I'm sure the, the material requirements, they get pushed down from North America where the engineering design houses are down to their global platforms. But they're going to go from, uh, um, you know, medium strength steel is going to, uh, is going to go down from 46% uh, down to 33%. Mild steel is going to, it's, it's pretty much where it's likely to end up anyways, you know, 10, 11%. I don't think they can get down any less than that. Uh, dual phase steels will increase Advanced high strength steels will increase. So, uh, and uh, the, by advanced high strength steels, I'm talking about the uh, the Martin City grade there. So that's General Motors story. But if you look at uh, Daimler Chrysler, or so, sorry, I should say uh, Fiat, uh, Chrysler Fiat, uh, Daimler is out of the picture now. Uh, again, the similar story, where um, you know the uh, the green the medium strength steels is going to is 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 sort of shrinking uh, in 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 terms of the pie chart and uh, the advanced high strength steels is growing as a larger and larger percent of the overall product makeup of a of a uh, for a body in white typically so again uh, good news uh, if you're in the coated steel business bad news if you cannot make the advanced high strength steels in Europe, similar story, uh, whether it's BMW or Mercedes or Volvo, they all show, you know, between uh, 2005 and 2010, I'm sure there's more, late, uh, there's more recent data, but I, don't, I couldn't find any. 
uh, it shows again the growth of advanced high strain steels. So a similar picture, not just in North America, but also in Europe. And uh, if it hasn't come in Asia, and it hasn't really in India and China, uh, it will shortly come. I think uh, once steel companies have stepped up to being able and demonstrate that they can make advanced high strain steels, uh, I think the conversion will go not just from uncoated uh, low strength steels or medium strength steels to uncoated, it'll go from uncoated medium strength steels to advanced high strength coated steels. I think that's where I predict uh, things will, will go. A uh, little bit about other products. Uh, there was talk about uh, uh, zinc, aluminum, magnesium. I, I, I know I've, I was involved with ArcelorMittal for many years and, and uh, the product, uh, I didn't realize it would come up here, but uh, yes, there's zinc 55% aluminum that I think a few people in, in, in uh, India make, uh, either Galvalume or Zincalum. Uh, zinc 5% aluminum or Galfan type uh, chemistries. And then, of course, the zinc, aluminum, magnesium variants from three different companies with three different chemistries, all trying to reduce the amount of uh, coating weight that's applied in order to deliver the same service life. So uh, I know particularly because I was involved in the licensing and, and, inst uh, and the introduction of Galvalum in Canada in 1981, uh, we were giving 20-year warranties uh, on our standing seam low slope proofs and uh, you know there's there's easily talk now we've we've done tests we've measured coating weight corrosion uh, losses and and we're very comfortable with 40 years now uh, the projection based on math uh, you know extrapolation on math is showing you know it's projecting 60 year lives but as any statistician will tell you you cannot project outside your data range so uh, these are uh, these are something to sort of uh, look at, but not necessarily things that are going to achieve. Uh, but certainly, 40 years on Galvalum is now quite uh, readily uh, available, and uh, a lot of companies are, I wouldn't say giving guarantees, but they're giving uh, uh, engineering estimates that go up membrane, you know, EPDM type roofs, you know, the tar and gravel roofs, as we call them, and. Uh, those, uh, those are being successfully replaced or topped with uh, a low slope uh, galvalume or uh, mainly galvalume roofs because North America is totally galvalume on the roofing side. Uh, having said that, uh, there's the, the zinc 5% aluminum supply has now become available from one mil, right? Uh, uh, the text and, and uh, again, I don't know how successful they're going to be with just the only supplier in, in the continent, but uh, certainly it gives a, a designer more options. Uh, and then of course uh, we are all uh, familiar with uh, anti-fingerprint type post-apply coatings in line on a CGL. Uh, there's a variety of them available for uh, anti-fingerprinting, there's also ROHS compliant, um, uh, they include also uh, phosphating or pre-phosphating, you know, applied online. So. These are some of the developments that are happening, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what more come up. But I think uh, I think this is it for the foreseeable future. So, in conclusion, uh, sheet continuous sheet galvanizing will will continue to grow in our global.